This is the 59th message in the series on prophecy, and our message tonight is in the 17th chapter of Revelation. I'm going to take the time to read the entire chapter. It's only 18 verses. Don't panic. And uh, by reading these 18 verses, you will have clearly before you the subject of our message. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's in exile. What he writes is what he sees in a vision, what is revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to do with things that were yet future in John's day and are yet future in our time. The events we are talking about tonight will take place after the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is that prophetic event where the Lord Jesus Christ will remove from this earth all who have been washed in his blood, all who are members of his church, his body, and his bride. That event may take place at any moment. It is imminent. There are no prophetic signs for it. We are waiting for that event now, looking toward heaven for the soon coming and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, fashion them like unto his own glorious body. These events we speak of tonight will take place after the removal of the church from earth. Yet this event and these things that are recorded in the 17th chapter are so speedily coming to pass now in our time that none can deny that we are on the very threshold of the great tribulation itself. Let us read the chapter together. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So I carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and, ne and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Highly symbolic language be true. And even though the book of Revelation is a book of symbols and mysterious signs, they are all explained someplace in this book. 
strange to me how we treat the Bible as we would not treat any other book in the world. No one would think of picking up a textbook on some exact science and reading the middle chapter and wondering what it meant, or reading the concluding chapter and saying, I can't make heads or tails of it. No one would pick up a fiction book and read the center part of it or pick out a paragraph of the 14th chapter and say, this is all Greek to me. It's all signs and symbols. I can't make heads or tails of it. Well, this is the way most people read the Bible. They pick up the Bible and they choose a chapter in the closing book and they read it and say, it's all Greek to me. It doesn't make any sense. Or they read a chapter out of the middle of the book and they say, well, I don't even know what they're talking about. Who is this and what is that? The book has a tremendous continuity of thought from the beginning verses in Genesis to the end in Revelation. And though it were written by more than 40 different writers, I believe, 66 distinct books composed the whole Bible, written during different times in the history of civilization, under different circumstances by men from different backgrounds, Yet it carries one central theme from the beginning to the end, and we may well expect the symbolic language of the last chapter to be explained someplace else in the book. So it isn't as mysterious as it sounds. This is the book of Revelation. It is where God revealed through Jesus Christ to John the coming glory of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. The events of the future are recorded here as exact, as clearly written and defined as though someone were observing the course of events in our times, writing them down in a book. Daniel, centuries before the coming of Jesus, saw the rise and fall of four world empires, gave them in the exact order in which they appeared on the scene of history, calculated the exact number of years until the coming of Messiah the exact number of years until his cutting off at the cross of Calvary, and all of these prophecies were minutely fulfilled as history went on its course. No man could devise such infallible prophecy. These are the words of God. And in the book of Revelation, we have the unfolding of future events. We have the end times pictured before us. The The scene is the Great Tribulation, a period of seven years of history on earth, yet in the future, to take place after the removal of God's people from earth. It will be dominated by two strong personalities, by two great federations, one a spiritual or religious federation, another a political federation. These two tremendous kingdoms or confederacies headed by two great personalities dominate the entire scene of the tribulation. We have already preached on the beast, the coming world dictator. We have also preached on his kingdom. This is the scarlet beast that we see in this vision. The scarlet beast is the kingdom of the beast king. It is the revived Roman Empire unified under one strong leader. It will obviously include the United States as well as the other strong cubs of the British lion. It will include the now known European nations, which is my reason for saying that communism will never take over Europe. Europe will be unified again. The United States of Europe will become a reality just as the politicians of Europe now hope and pray it will. The beast king will reign over this Western Confederacy and will go to war in a final world war against the Northern Confederacy of Russian Communism and the Eastern Confederacy of Chinese and Asian Communism. This is Bible prophecy. And a few years ago, men reading these things in the Bible threw up their hands and said, how can Russia ever become a world power? How can the Chinese ever rise up and become a threat to world peace? And now in our time, we have seen both nations fulfill their role in prophecy. 
This is the picture as far as the coming events are concerned. But this scarlet beast, which is composed of ten nations, three which are subdued by the beast king in the organization of this confederacy, this scarlet beast with the ten heads is ridden or controlled or guided by a mysterious woman. And that's the subject of our message tonight. John sees the woman. Upon inter being introduced to her, she is described by this humiliating phrase. She is called the great whore. She sits upon many waters. She has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. The inhabitants of the earth are drunk on the wine of her fornication. She is arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And he notices that in her hand is a cup. The cup is full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. She is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And then he notices that upon her forehead, where they used to put the sign of adulteresses, there was a name written, and the name was simply Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And when John saw her, he was filled with wonder, with awe. He had never seen anything like it in his time. It was an amazing revelation to him. He understands now what the scarlet beast is. It is the kingdom of the beast king that will come. It is the western confederacy out of which will come a world empire and a world ruler. But John sees this political kingdom, this political beast being ridden and controlled by a woman. The beast kingdom carries her for a while. But after she has ridden this scarlet beast into power, God puts it in the hearts of the kings of that confederacy to hate her. And they turn on her, although she has been their ally and their friend and their helper, they turn on her and destroy her, absolutely annihilate her, and she ceases to exist. Now, what does this woman symbolize? Who is this woman? Well, first we use Bible definitions to arrive at a Bible explanation. A harlot or a whore, and that's not a bad word. It's in the dictionary along with other bad words. <laughs> and I looked it up to see specifically what it meant, and I will tell you specifically what the dictionary says about it. A whore is a woman who prostitutes her body, either for gain or for power, whatever it may happen to be. A woman who indiscriminately engages in filthiness, sexual perversion, and intercourse with others with whom it's unlawful. And this word is used correctly, and this is not a new phrase to Bible readers. It is symbolic throughout the pages of Scripture of religious uncleanness. Israel was the wife of Jehovah. He chose that nation to be his wife on the earth. She is referred to over and over in the Old Testament prophecies as the wife of Jehovah. But when she turned away from the true and living God and went into idolatry and set up strange idols and images and bowed down to them and gave to them the love and adoration that belonged to her husband who was God, 17 times in one chapter alone in prophecy, she is referred to as a harlot or a whore or an unclean adulteress, for she was unfaithful to her husband. 
A prostitute is not a woman who simply had a love affair with someone other than her husband. A prostitute is one who has prostituted her body commercially. And when Israel went after strange gods, it was not that she turned to serve one god, but many gods. And she is referred to in prophecy as a spiritual harlot, a spiritual whore. Maybe you don't like the sound of that word, but it's in the Bible, and I don't know any other word to use. You hear it on the street, you just as well hear it here. So the language of the revelation is not strange to the Bible reader. He knows full well what God means when he speaks of the harlot in a spiritual sense. She is no literal woman. She is no literal personality that will appear on the scene. She is symbolic of some unclean, adulterous, religious system. <coughs> She is the exact opposite of the true religious system of the New Testament called the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ, who one day at the marriage of the Lamb will become the wife of the Lord Jesus Christ forever, she is the spiritual body of the Lord Jesus now. This woman is the counterfeit of the bride of Christ. She is the exact opposite of the body of Christ. She is the anti-church. We've spoken of the antichrist. She is the anti-church. And she is the religious system that is put together by the false prophet after the rapture of the true church. There is nothing that will stand in the way of a world church. It's coming. It is pictured here in prophecy as the unclean woman called Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Now, there are several identifying marks that tell us something about this religious confederacy that will come into being during the tribulation. The location of it is plainly and clearly given. Verse 9 says that she sits on seven mountains. Verse 18 says that that woman is that great city which reigneth over the king's of the earth. Every schoolboy knows, or should know, that there is one city referred to by practically every historian of time as not only the eternal city, but the seven-hilled city. It is the city of Rome in Italy. The imperial coinage of the days of John, for instance, bore a picture of a great woman sitting on a seven-hilled city with a cup in her hand. And it was description of the city of Rome, reigning over the kings of the earth. So in John's mind, there could be no other interpretation for the words of the Holy Spirit. This great, unclean religious system sits in the seven-hilled city of Rome. But it was a mystery to John. He was filled with awe when he saw her. For in John's time, there was no such thing as an unclean religious system who sat in the city of Rome and exerted her influence over the kings of the earth. No wonder he's filled with awe and admiration. He can't figure out who this woman is. There was no such woman existing in John's time. But she was to come, and she did come. Her counterpart is the Roman Catholic Church. I've studied prophecy for 20 years, and every time I've come to this place in the book of Revelation, I wish that there was some other interpretation. It 
because when you say that, people say you're a bigot. You're prejudiced. Why, you're just talking against the good Catholic people. I'm not talking against the good Catholic people. I am talking against a corrupt religious system. There are many good people in the Roman Catholic Church, many honest people, many moral people, many sincere, dedicated, consecrated people in the Roman Catholic Church. And I am sure that there are even some saved people in the Roman Catholic Church who are saved in spite of what the Church teaches and not because of it. And if there weren't any saved people in the Roman Catholic Church, I would be hard-pressed to explain the words that come from heaven in the midst of this vision. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins. This great woman, however, is not the Roman Catholic Church, period. The Roman Catholic Church alone cannot fulfill the demands of this prophetic passage. For she is described as the mother of harlots. She is the mother of a vast family of harlots. She has many daughters, and all of her daughters are just like her. They are a corrupt religious system. They're all united in this one great mother, and they all receive their power through this one great mother. And in the end times, I am positive that the world church will be formed by a union between Protestantism and Catholicism, but it will never be Catholicism joining with the Protestants. It will be the Protestants returning to the Holy Mother Church, as she describes herself. The movement is underway now, has been for a number of years. It will be a reality because the Bible prophesies that it will be. She sits on many waters. The many waters are described or defined in verse 15. The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, which is another way of saying that the nature of this corrupt religious system will be universal. A worldwide corrupt religious system. Do you know, I'm sure you do, what the word Catholic means? It means universal. It means worldwide. It can mean peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And when she speaks of herself and calls herself the Roman Catholic Church, she is speaking of the church universal. I just read again today an article released by the Roman Church where she restated, let there be no mistake about this, we are the true universal church of Christ, outside of which there is no salvation. And this Catholic spokesman said what all Catholic spokesmen have been saying for centuries. There will be no union of Protestantism and Catholicism if Protestantism is depending upon us to desert our position and come to theirs. They must return to the Holy Mother Church from whence they came, and return they will. You know, the Romans had a saying, and it went like this, all roads lead where? To Rome. And in the center of the city of Rome was that golden hub, measuring the mileage to the principal cities of the known world, for Rome was the eternal seven-hilled city. And John sees in his vision this unclean woman. And all of the descriptive terms in this chapter dealing with this woman are marks that characterize the Roman Catholic Church today and her many harlot daughters. Do not say, then, that the woman 
is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is involved in it, but she has many daughters. Let us examine her name. Well, first let's look at her, the way she's arrayed in verse 4. She is arrayed in purple, in scarlet color. She is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Notice, first of all, and the thing that I like to call attention to first, there is no mention of silver in her array. Yes, she's decked out in gold and precious stones and pearls and purple and scarlet, but no silver, for silver is the type of redemption in the Scripture. She has no redemption to offer, but she has this vast wealth. Scarlet and purple are the colors of the College of the Cardinals. It is the royal colors of the Vatican itself. And in history, it is the combined colors of priesthood and royalty. <coughs> I was telling Lady coming down, where do you start on a subject like this? And where do you finish? For instance, if you would go back to the beginning in the book of Genesis and trace the fact, and it can be traced, that God established among the peoples of earth that church and state would always be separate. You thought that was an American principle. It's a Bible principle. The kings that were to rule over Judah could only come from the house of Judah. But the priests could only come from the house of Levi thereby assuring that the priesthood and the throne would never be united. Separate was the political rule over the people and the spiritual dealings of God with his people. Church and state separated in the very beginning and kept separate down through the years of history. While man has dreamed and worked for a marriage of church and state into one tremendous political religious empire against which there could be no opposing voice. Rome has accomplished that wherever the Catholic Church has conquered. Go in any nation in Europe where Catholicism has conquered. Go into French Quebec in Canada above us. Go in Mexico or in the Latin American and South American countries and see that wherever the Roman Catholic Church has prevailed, there is the union of state and church. The church has become the state religion and the woman that rides the beast of political government. John sees it worldwide in the end time. But he adds one dimension that Catholicism has not enjoyed. She has many daughters. They're all harlots. So this one woman is a family of harlots joined together in one. And that is the union of Protestantism and Catholicism that is now the present dream and the present program of the World Council of Churches has been since the old Federal Council of Churches years and years ago. Read it in their own plans and manifestos. Simply spelled out and loudly proclaimed. It has been the dream of the ecumenical leaders for years and years of time. But they would live to see a union of all denominations headed up by the Roman Catholic Church into one world lobby that no government could resist. Therefore, it is the dream of our present religious re leaders to rule the world through a world church, a state church controlling a world government. Now, you could have read that in the papers without coming down here tonight. You can read it in the speech of every ecumenical leader in the denominational world today. It comes periodically from the Vatican, from the very mouth of the Pope himself, from the mouths of the cardinals, from the bishops down to the priests. 
It is the main line of thinking of the Roman Catholic Church. They are drawing closer and closer and closer to that great spirit of ecumenicism that will suddenly sweep all opposition away and will weld the religions of the world into one massive controlling power block that will ride herd on the nations of the world. And John saw it coming to pass centuries before any man would have ever dreamed of such a thing. Her name, Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. In order to rise to such power, it was necessary for her to commit fornication with the kings of the earth. This is how she got her name, the great whore. She prostituted herself. She sold everything that was sacred and clean and chaste and precious for a price. The price, world power. The price, control over the souls of men as it is listed in the 18th chapter. She has connived with rulers since the day that organized religion connived with the rulers of her time and crucified the Lord of glory. She has prostituted herself, spoiled and defiled everything that she ever held as precious in order to come to this end that John sees her aspiring to and coming to. In the course of this fornication with the kings of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, when you get drunk on wine, one thing, your senses become dulled, very dulled. You lose a sense of direction. You do things you wouldn't ordinarily do when you were sober. And not only are your senses dulled, while your senses are being dulled, your body is being destroyed. And during the course of organized religion, committing fornication with the kings of the earth, the common peoples of the world have had their senses dulled toward the truth of God and their souls destroyed. Mystery, Babylon, the great. Now, the term Babylon is nothing new to Bible readers either. Babylon was a great world empire in the time of Daniel. But Babylon goes back into history farther than the empire that carried Judah off captivity in the day of Daniel. It goes back to the beginning of that empire, which was the Tower of Babel itself. Now, I want you to understand that this woman is organized religion. It is the anti-church. It is the world church under the false prophet. She is not literal Babylon restored. She has the spiritual character of Babylon. Like many times, God uses things on earth to describe the spiritual state of men or cities or nations. He refers to one place as a Sodom. We don't understand him to mean that it's literally Sodom rebuilt. It's Sodom-like. It has the character of Sodom. Other times he refers to places as Egypt. Not really Egypt, but like Egypt. He refers to other places as Jerusalem. Not really Jerusalem, but like Jerusalem. He refers to this great harlot and calls her Babylon the Great. All that characterized the Babylonian Empire, all that characterized the Tower of Babel, characterizes her. Whenever you think of the Babylonians, everything that comes to your mind is fulfilled in her. I was also saying coming down, which I about the only time I get to talk to Lena. That's the reason I always say so many things coming down. I said if if the saints of God had the time and the patience and the stomach for it, 
they should wade through a very wonderful book by Hislop called The Two Bathrooms. It's about 500 pages in fine print. And if you don't go blind or get sick of your stomach before you get through, you'll come out greatly enlightened. He traces the history from the Tower of Babel to modern times. And he shows with indisputable evidence that the present day Roman Catholic Church is the heir of everything that was established in the Tower of Babel and continued in Babylonian paganism. He shows that every doctrine Rome teaches, every sacrifice, every mystery, every dogma, every sacrament, everything she holds holy and precious is a made-over renovated, remodeled, Babylonian bit of paganism. It's too lengthy to discuss tonight, but the very name Babel means gate of God or gate to God. And the Tower of Babel constructed by Nimrod, who went out from the presence of the Lord, and organized man together in the first organized attempt to reach heaven by works. Pure and simple, that's all it was. The first organized attempt by the peoples of this world to make man their God. For when Nimrod built the temple or the tower and established the worship of that tower, they started out worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars, offering sacrifices on top of that tower to the sun, moon, and stars. But man can't long worship the stars. He has to have a deity that's like himself. And so suddenly into the worship of the Babylonians came the deification of Nimrod himself. After all, was he not the founder of his religion? Was he not the leader? Was he not the prophet? Therefore, was he not God himself come to lead the people? And so sacrifices were made to Nimrod, and worship was directed to him, but not enough. And so the next object of veneration became Nimrod's wife and Nimrod's son. When his son was born, Nimrod told the people that his wife was the person God referred to when he said, the seed of a woman shall come, and bruised the head of the serpent. In other words, Nimrod told the people that his wife was the Virgin Mary and his son was Jesus Christ. Plain and simple what he taught. And the people began to worship her and the baby. And this is the origin of the veneration of Mary. And the whole cult of Mariolatry was derived from the Babylonian worship of Nimrod's wife and infant baby, or infant child. I'd just as well go ahead and ruin the rest of the week for you. When Nimrod's son grew up, he went boar hunting. I could have directed him some people, the biggest boars I know. But they, he went boar hunting, and he got killed. Well, what are we going to tell the people now? God got killed by a wild boar? <laughs> so... Nimrod's wife came to the rescue, and she went in the search of her son and came back and told the people that she had raised him by, from the dead by her own personal power and that he was now going off into some other country to tend to his business. But never fear, he was very much alive. And so, before this announcement by Nimrod's wife, 
she had gathered the Vestal Virgins together, which was the origin of the Roman Catholic nunnery. <clears throat> Young ladies dedicated to be the virgin spiritual bride of Nimrod. So she gathered the Vestal Virgins together, and they had a period of 40 days mourning over the death of her son. At the end of the 40 days, she announced that she had raised him from the dead, and he was now alive. And so they had a celebration in which they gave eggs to one another, because eggs was a sign of life out of death. And uh, it was the origin of our Christian worship called Easter. Easter is pagan came from Babel, from Nimrod, from satanic cult worship that has nothing whatever to do with God. And the 40 days of mourning has become, what? Lent. Well, they went one better than that. Since this great miracle was performed in Babylon, they designated his birthday, which happened to fall in December, as a hot another feast. And they designated the evergreen tree as the symbol of that feast, for it symbolized the eternal life of Nimrod's son. And that's where you got your Christmas tree. And that's where you got your Christmas celebration. You got it right from the pit of hell. And it's been sold to you by the great whore as a religious observance. I defy you to find one single word in the Bible in regards to Christmas or Easter, either one. You cannot find it. It's not there. You see why the earth is drunk on the wine of her fornication? Our senses dulled until we can't even think straight. We drink any cup she hands us, but her cup is filled with abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Everything that is now taught by the present Roman Catholic system had its origin in the satanic worship of the Babylonians. The confessional was a Babylonian institution. The nunneries were Babylonian institutions. The great dogmas of the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven was first taught in regards to Nimrod's wife. All that is now applied to the Virgin Mary was first taught in regards to Nimrod's wife. Later, they organized a priesthood who was to continue teaching the people these mysteries, as they called them. And mystery is one of the key words of Roman Catholic liturgy. It is the mystery of the lights on the altar. It is the mystery of this and the mystery of that. And the priesthood organized had as its head a high priest. The high priest was the pontiff. And so down through the years of the Babylonian worship, the high priest or pope reigned over his priesthood and his nunneries and carried on the exact same worship that we know today as Catholicism. Then there came a time when the Roman emperors wanted to be everything. And they wanted to be pontiff too, as well as emperor. And the first wedding of church and state took place when one of the Caesars was also named the head of Babylonian worship. Through histori history's story, we read how the seat of this satanic worship changed from Babylon to Pergamos and then to Rome and the ultimate wedding where the head of the Roman Catholic Church fell heir to all that Babylon was, and she has continued unchanged down to this present time. And now she sits upon many waters, reigning from the seven-hilled city, saying she is a queen, saying she is the true bride, saying she is the true religious system of earth, God's perspective is that she is a great whore and that her judgment will come 
during the tribulation time. Now let us talk for a moment about the fact that she is the mother of harlots. She has many daughters. That is, many religious systems came from her womb. Many religious systems originated with her. Do you know that all of Protestantism came out of Romanism? Do you know that the, all of denominationalism is the offspring of Catholicism? She still prides herself in saying that she is the holy mother church and all Protestantism are her daughters. True, they are now disobedient. They are now wayward daughters. But Rome ever sits ready, waiting to welcome all her wayward daughters back into her arms. Now, I've had a chance to observe Protestantism for 20 years from a biblical standpoint. And I have seen Protestantism move closer and closer to its ultimate wedding with Catholicism year by year. Time was, after the Reformation, and in a few following years, when Protestantism really was the voice of the Bible in the world, and really did proclaim the truth that was revealed to Martin Luther. The Holy Spirit never revealed to Martin Luther that he should found the Lutheran Church. And the Holy Spirit never revealed to his followers and cohorts that they should form separate denominations, emphasizing separate doctrines. Denominationalism is satanic, for its ultimate aim is to divide the true body of Christ. It is to camouflage and disguise the truth of the body of Christ until men are lost in confusion. The word Babylon means confusion. She is called the great confusion. Someday, if the Lord doesn't come, and the Lord ever slows me down by breaking both my legs or giving me a heart attack or something, I'm going to write a book on the great confusion. And I'm going to show precisely what I'm showing here tonight that Protestantism per se is charged in the word of God with the same wickedness as Catholicism. And they're moving closer and closer and closer. They have seduced the peoples of the Protestant world and they will lead them ultimately back to Rome. Why, dear friends, you go in most Protestant churches today what difference do you see between that church and the Catholic Church? Protestantism now has adopted the high altar with all of its crucifixes and crosses and candelabra and mysteries. It has now even adopted the jargon of Rome and refers to the area to which it serves now as its parish or its diocese. Certain Protestant communions have even now referred to their clergy as the priesthood. And we go into what one time was a sound fundamental denomination, and here is a man dressed in the garb of a Roman Catholic priest with the burning candles before him and the high altar behind him, chanting his liturgies. Some places they call them responsive readings. Going through the annex, of the Roman Church, mimicking, aping all that is seen in any Catholic Church anywhere in the world, and preaching the same meaningless things, making the same absurd assertions, and claiming the same spiritual power over the people that the priesthood claims. For a number of years, I've seen no difference between the organized Protestant clergy and the Roman Catholic priesthood. 
She has many daughters. Most denominational churches today are teaching and preaching to their people a set of traditions that have completely replaced the Word of God, unrelated to the Word of God, have instituted a set of feast days and holy observances and festivals that are completely pagan in origin, have no biblical grounds whatever, and the people stupefied by the drink that they are drinking sit there imagining that they are listening to the true representatives of God. Deception is her trade. The name of the game is deception. And the great whore has many daughters. And you better believe this, that those daughters know who their mother is. And they know where they ultimately must go and where they ultimately will go. I threw away. I used to be great years ago for clipping out things. And I used to have all these things documented, and I had a whole file cabinet full of paper clippings and newspaper articles and underlined and underscored things that I'd picked up so that I could say, look here, if you doubt what I'm saying, read it right here with your own eyes. And I threw them all away. <laughs> I threw them all away because I realized that the burden of preaching the prophecy of God is not proof is to declare what God has said and let the Holy Spirit do with it what he will in your hearts. If you have eyes to see, you can see what I'm saying tonight. And if you have ears to hear, you can hear what I'm saying. If you have vision, the vision that John had, you can see this great woman and see her being formed before your very eyes. Drunken on the blood of the saints and on the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Did you know that hanging in the Basilica in Rome tonight is a mural painted uh, describing or depicting the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day where 22,000 true believers died in a bloodbath at the hands of the Roman Catholic Cardinals? Do you know that a special mass was celebrated by the Pope in the night that those precious Christians died and he praised God in the Basilica? for the holy slaughter of the enemies of the church? And did you know that the cardinals who wielded the sword and directed that massacre and that night carried their orders from the Pope himself? And it is still looked upon as one of the major victories of Roman Catholicism in Europe. Did you know that on even yet some of the papal coins is the honor bestowed upon those who massacred the Christians in St. Bartholomew's Day, on St. Bartholomew's Day? Do you know that the Roman Catholic Church, even though she has been charged and proven to be guilty of the awful Holy Office of Inquisition in the Spanish and Italian Inquisitions and some that were carried out in South America, not so well publicized, but do you know that tonight she has never one time ever publicly repudiated the acts of those people who acted for the Roman Catholic Church, nor has she ever denied that she was the instigator of those murders and those slaughters? If ever there was a human institution existed on the face of the earth that is drunk on the blood of the saints, the Roman Catholic Church is drunk on the blood of the saints. History proves that it cannot be denied. And she has many daughters who learn from their mother and who will be just as quick and have been just as quick to take human blood in defense of the faith as their prostitute mother. And if the Lord doesn't come soon, we may see some of that. Now, you say what you want to, but I'm speaking from experience. I've had my life threatened more than once. And I do believe that if the restraint that's in this country were not as great as it is tonight, I might well be a dead man instead of a living man. I believe organized religion would rejoice in the day of my death, be thrilled to death at the news that I'd died. I don't think that Rome's daughters are above spilling my blood if they had opportunity and time. 
if Jesus permits. Never, never underestimate the power of organized religion. It is satanic. I'm not attacking the people. I was a part of it, and I was for years, and I was a saved man. I knew and loved the Lord Jesus Christ and was caught up in the tentacles of this octopus. I'm not attacking the people. God gives a call to those people. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins. It is God's urgent appeal, his pleading with his people. My people, he says, are in her. Come out of her. Don't be partaker of her sins any longer. And one of the things that touches me more about this whole situation is the fact that God says that the light of the candle shall no more at all shine in thee. This is verse 23 of chapter 18. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, which means that there was a time before the judgment of God upon this false religious system when the true voice of the bridegroom was heard in her, and the true voice of the bride was heard in her, and the true light of a candlestick shone in her, which means that there were those who were saved, who were once involved in that religious system, and it is to them that God appeals, come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins. And I don't care what you say, I have been through this from personal experience. I have gone through it several scores of times with others. There is no scriptural logic in the reasoning that we must stay in apostasy to give voice to the gospel. God's word is come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins. And I believe that there is an inference there that those who deliberately stay in apostasy after hearing the clear command of God may share in some respects the guilt of her sins. I came to a place where I could no longer strengthen the hands of an evil system that sought to seduce the souls of men. I couldn't stay any longer in this great woman whose ambition is to control the governments of the world through religious and spiritual power. She has many daughters. Oh, they're, they're wayward now. They have strayed from home through the efforts of the reformers. But you see, what happened during the Reformation was that God wondrously gave truth to the reformers. But no man received any orders from the Holy Spirit to form another woman. The woman was formed. It was formed back yonder when the true mystery came into existence. Not mystery Babylon. Not mystery confusion. The mystery of the bride of Christ. She was made from the wounded side of the Lord Jesus. She has existed in the world since the gospel of grace was preached and Jews and Gentiles were made one by the Holy Spirit. The church universal has been in the world since the days of the Apostle Paul. And in the Reformation, the Holy Spirit was calling his people out of Babylon the Great, the great whore, to walk in the light of that true mystery, which is the body and bride of our Lord Jesus Christ. And many of those men came out of Catholicism to fall into the deeper pit of Protestantism. And the divisions of Protestantism today that have almost stamped out from the face of the earth the truth of the body of Christ were formed back there in the fires of the Reformation. The well-meaning 
but deceived men who built little Catholic churches all over the world and called them Lutherans and Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Episcopalian and something else. And they called men out of one organization into another and out of one harlot bride into another. There is one church. Jesus founded it. There is one church. It is not an organization. It is an organism. It is a spiritual body composed of every man and woman, boy and girl that's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And by the Holy Spirit they have been joined to our Lord Jesus Christ, and they can't be joined to anything else. They can only be involved, but they can't be joined. Come out of her, my people, to be not partaker of her sins. i never forget the day the saint of God quoted that verse of Scripture to me, not directly to me, but in conversation with me, and asked me, what does it mean? And standing there at a loss for words, I knew in my heart what it meant. But it so convicted me and so made me to realize that it was the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to me, come out of her, come out of her, lest you be partaker of her sins. It was a number of years before I came out of her. So great is her deception that I was many years trying to figure out exactly who she was and where she was and how I really could get out of her. For I found out that every form of sectarianism is another one of her daughters. And every form of Protestantism is another one of her harlot children. There is one bride, and if you're associated with or belong to or involved in any other bride than that bride, you are the object of this call, come out of her, my people, lest you be partaker of her sins. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this message and thy word, and we leave it just with you. We have no proof to offer. We have no evidence to present. We just simply are here to proclaim what you say in your word and what we know is true in our heart, for the Holy Spirit has witnessed to the truth of it. Now you do what you will and what you must in the hearts of those who have heard it. If there be any who are involved in that harlot woman, we pray that thou wouldst call them out. They would hear thy voice and come out of her, lest they be partaker of her sins. In Jesus' precious name we pray for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.